All right. Well, I'm Devin Skillion, and um, welcome to my. Uh, this is my workspace at home. I'm at my desk, um, where I do a lot of work as a writer. And um, you get to see my Indian friend back there behind me, sort of. That's Chief uh, Chief Tahlequah, uh, who uh, kind of looks over me as I write. It was a funny thing. Um, I told my my wife that I was uh, I was coming in here to Skype this morning to talk to a school about a uh, career day, and she said, "Which one?" Not meaning which school, she meant which career. <laughs> so I'll get in a little bit later into the fact that I've got kind of a number of different jobs. Um, but the one that I was gonna that I'm obviously planning on talking to you about, and the one that I uh, tend to think of as my true profession is uh, journalism. I. I joke all the time with people that uh, that journalism is just temporary until my music career works out. That that's my real job, but that's just kidding because I do feel like you know my profession is uh, is in journalism, and I think it's a uh, it's a, an honorable, um, great uh, great profession that I that I think is terribly terribly important. You know, there's a um, uh, people people off you'll often hear people say. Well, um, you know, journalism is a business, and that's true. It is a business. It's a big business in the United States. But there's also a reason why journalism is uh, mentioned in the Constitution. It's the only business that's mentioned by name in the Constitution uh, because it's a terribly important part of a fully formed and functioning democracy. It's really important that we have a free an active press in America, and um, it's uh, it's something that I'm very concerned about the future of, because I'm not really sure where journalism is headed, and we'll get into that in just a little bit too. Um, but let me start with. It looks like my picture keeps going light and dark. Is that right? <laughs> Sorry about that. It's the lighting in here. A little bit. Let's see if there's any way to adjust the light a little bit. Well, we'll get by with it. Um, when I uh, originally, I, I, I didn't quite, uh, I, I can't tell you that journalism was something that I thought about for uh, forever. Um, when I originally went to uh, school at the University of Kansas, uh, I went because I wanted to study theater and had a partial theater scholarship and was very interested in acting and um, always really liked the, uh, the, the, uh, the pressure of a live performance. And um, it was interesting. As I got to school, I uh, started working at the campus radio station. I was uh, uh, a, a DJ on an underground rock station that played like music by the Dead Kennedys. Um, and it was very, very uh, early one Sunday morning um, because I had a crazy, I had a crazy skip. My my shift was like midnight or uh, two a.m. to six a.m. or something on Sundays. And um, uh, one morning, uh, we had a little television in the radio studio uh, that we used to just get the time and temperature off of. Well, I was bored and started, you know, flicking around to see what else was on while the music was playing one Sunday morning uh, back in 1982. And uh, came across uh, this, there was a special report on TV, and they were saying that this, uh, the American uh, Marine forces that were uh, in based in Lebanon had uh, been bombed that morning. Now, I don't know what it was that possessed me to think that my radio audience listening uh, to the Dead Kennedys that morning wanted to needed to know what was going on in Lebanon. But I had started to take a, a few journalism classes as well, and that moment I thought. I got to let people know what's going on. And so I started scribbling down notes and in between songs, I would say, well, you know, there's been, and, and it's, I, I've got it still somewhere uh, on tape. And the very first time that I went in with this news, uh, I was so nervous and my voice was shaking. It's kind of it's funny in hindsight, you know, I, I, it was, I was so breathy. I was like, there, there, there's, there's been a bombing and, and, and the, these Marines <laughs> and, uh, it was it was kind of uh, it was kind of comical um, on a couple of levels. Not only my performance of it, but also that I thought that you know this was going to be uh, KJCK or KJHK in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, was going to needed to be this outlet for this news. Uh, uh, but by the end of the morning, 
I was going on about the multinational forces that were stationed there in Beirut and, uh, you know, why they, they, they also, the, the French forces had been attacked in much the same way. And, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of waxing on about what had happened. And I think that really lit a fuse in me for uh, it kind of crisscrossed what I liked about theater, the pressure of a live performance with sort of this cerebral uh, got to think on your feet and the script changes every day kind of thing uh, that the journalism has. And so I think that day had a lot to do with why I do what I do now. I was getting more interested in journalism, but that day really kind of lit, lit my fire. And then one day... I was uh, hanging around the theater department at KU, and somebody came in and put up a, um, uh, a notice on the bulletin board, because it, it was where they used to put all of the um, casting uh, notices. And that day, somebody came in and posted something that they were, that the campus television uh, station was looking for an anchor, uh, it's two anchor, an anchor man and an anchor woman, uh, to anchor the campus, the, the uh, University of Kansas campus newscast. And... In my way of thinking, it looked like an acting job. I thought, well, I bet I can go act like an anchorman. So I show up at the audition, and I had completely um, miscalculated what was going on. I uh, show up, and every journalism student at the university is there. They've all got their, you know, all these guys have got their coat and tie on, and they're holding these scripts that they've, I didn't even know that the script had been available. They're holding these scripts that they had, uh, many of them had seemed to have gotten a few days earlier to prepare. Um, and I thought, uh oh, I'm in kind of over my head here. But I ended up getting the, uh, I ended up getting the, the, uh, the job as as anchor, and that was the other thing I think that really kind of lit my fuse on on getting interested in journalism. And so slowly I started to move. I mean, I stayed very active in the theater department. I kind of had to to keep my scholarship money, um, but changed my major. Uh, couldn't get into the journalism school until I was a a junior, but changed my major to journalism. And I was just very very lucky that I happened to be at a good journalism school. The University of Kansas is a a terrific journalism school. Although it's more based on uh, print and newspaper and magazine there. Um, but it turned out they were really just starting to develop their television program, too. So I switched my major and then, you know, really just sort of launched myself into the, into the world of television journalism. And there were a lot of different things that I loved about, being, about journalism. I love, uh, I love writing and talk a little bit about my other writing career here in a little bit. But um, when you get right down to it, that's what a journalist really is. A journalist is a writer. And our job is uh, in journalism is to kind of write the first draft of history as it's happening, um, chronicling the times in which we live. And that's um, – uh, I love that idea. I love that, the seriousness of it. Also, though, uh, have to say it gives you a front row seat often uh, on history as it's happening. Now, it can be something that is simple as covering a school board meeting, uh, something that now, it's not history-making every night, and uh, you, most of the time you're not covering something that's history-making. Every once in a while, you know, you find yourself, like uh, in my case, I, was, uh, I couldn't believe it. There I was sitting in Sydney, Australia, watching the opening ceremony to the Olympic Games in, uh, in 2000. And just I thought, good gosh, I can't believe that I'm here. I can't believe that I picked a job that uh, lets me see something like this happening. Uh, I've been in my career as a journalist around the world a couple of times, um, done, did a documentary uh, just last year about Pope Francis that originated from the Vatican, and documentaries, uh, two of them now from China. Um, uh, I did a documentary on the forming of uh, Daimler Chrysler when Chrysler combined with Mercedes Benz, which was something that we had never seen before at the time. This, uh, a huge kind of merger like that that originated from Germany. So I feel very, I, I can't believe how all of that has worked out. I, mean, I feel very, very fortunate. On the other hand, I've also seen some pretty horrible things because you find yourself covering crimes that are awful, um, things that are very sad. 
and I was the anchor man. Uh, now we're just about to hit the 20th anniversary. I was the anchor man at KFOR TV, the NBC affiliate in Oklahoma City, uh, 20 years ago when the Murrah building uh, exploded and 168 people were killed. Um, saddest day of my life and uh, toughest day uh, of my uh, of my life as at least as, as, as my career as a journalist. Really, a real challenge that day because at about nine o'clock that morning. Even though our house where we lived in Oklahoma City was uh, 12 miles from downtown Oklahoma City, uh, I woke up in bed that morning because there was this explosion that shook my house, uh, and we were 12 miles away from what had happened. Um, so journalism has has shaped me as a person. Uh, you can't cover something like like that without it changing you in a lot of different ways, making you think about sort of life's big questions. <laughs> Um, journalism has, uh, given me, uh, the luxury of, like I said, getting to see a lot of the world, which is, uh, has been, has been a really exciting part of it for me because I'm, I grew up, my dad was in the army when I grew up, so we moved around a lot. And so getting to see a lot of the world and a lot of the country was, uh, something that was just kind of part of my upbringing, uh, lived in places like the Philippines as a kid. Um, and so I think that probably also had a lot to do uh, with the, why I was so attracted to, to journalism and getting to see a lot of different things and uh, meet a lot of different people and uh, go a lot of different places. Um, my career path uh, uh, is, uh, I think, pretty typical of a lot of people who do what I do. Um, I uh, am lucky enough to be the anchor at a really good TV station in a really big city in a really big market. We tend to talk about market size a lot. Uh, in journalism, and Detroit is the twelfth uh, biggest market in the country. Um, used to be much bigger than that, but of course, Detroit has lost a uh, uh, you know some population over the years, so it's shrunk a little bit. But the TV market itself st is still uh, very large. In fact, it includes it includes where you guys are. Um, so uh, when I left uh, the University of Kansas, I had actually started to work weekends uh, my senior year at the CBS affiliate in Topeka, Kansas, which is about half an hour away from uh, KU. Um, but my first full-time job, I was in Cater, Illinois, and was there for about 14 months, a little over a year. And then a job came open um, in uh, Tyler, Texas, which is about uh, halfway between Dallas, Texas, and Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, a lovely little city, and that was, um, that was my first job just as I was, uh, I was getting, Corey and I were getting married uh, that year. And so I was in uh, Tyler for uh, three years. And then left Tyler and went to Oklahoma City, which I mentioned earlier, and actually started there as the morning anchor and then worked my way up to the main anchor. And then it was a weird thing. I had... Um I really did want to challenge to see if I was up to the challenge of a much bigger market, and, and, and uh, Oklahoma City was a great place to live, and it is still a great television market. And uh, but I wanted to see if I could handle a bigger market and bigger, uh, bigger television. And so I had actually agreed to come to Detroit about a month before the bombing, bombing happened, um, which was which created another very strange experience. Uh, it was such an emotional thing covering the bombing, and that the day that the bombing happened, um, I was uh, at the anchor desk for, I don't, I don't know, I think about uh, 14 hours or something like that. It was a very, very long uh, day. We just got rid of all the commercials and just stayed on the air. And then the days after that, it was a very intense experience well um and uh we would i, I would kind of host this program uh it was basically a call-in program where we would let people call in and this went on all night long after our newscast was off at at 10 30 we would then uh turn on uh, kind of move into this other little studio and we would let people just call in and vent and talk about you know their feelings about what had happened and some people would call in with a a song that they wanted to do, recite or a poem other people would call in with a prayer uh, other people would call in with their own experience of having been in the bombing or somebody that they'd lost and those couple of days that we did that um i had no idea at the time but they were really rather powerfully connecting not only me to oklahoma city and the people of oklahoma but them to me 
and it got very, very difficult to leave. I, I, I've always said that if uh, if Detroit would have offered me the job after the bombing, I'm not sure that I would have left. I felt very guilty about leaving at the time, and I think it's very telling about the experience and about probably about the people of Oklahoma too, but 20 years after leaving Oklahoma City, I still get uh, the occasional letters, cards, emails, phone calls from people in Oklahoma City who just want to know how I'm doing. Um, it was a, a really uh, powerful thing. Um, I will also tell you, though, that it was, for, for it being the worst day of my life, it also changed the way that I, uh, it, it turned me into an optimist again, and it changed the way that I look at the world. Uh, by the time that the Oklahoma City bombing had happened, I'd had, you know, uh, I, I'd been in television news for about uh, 10 years, I guess. And I had started to develop the cynicism that a lot of journalists do, and I started to think that maybe the world we live in wasn't getting better. I had seen a lot of, you know, it covered a lot of crime. Uh, I had been, I had just gotten back from uh, Haiti, where I just saw uh, people who were so devastatingly poor and, and, and the worst kind of poverty that I'd ever seen. Uh, a year before that, I had been in, uh, the, uh, I had been in Siberia, in Russia. Uh, it was the first winter of democracy, and people there were so hungry and so cold. And uh, as bad as our winter was uh, here this past winter and, and last winter, uh, the warmest that it ever got, the warmest that it ever got while I was in Siberia was 17 degrees below zero. And um, so I had started to, to, to look around and think, you know, man, this world is a little bit of a mess. Well, the, the odd thing is, is that Oklahoma City, for as horrible as it was, really changed my mind. Because as bad as Oklahoma City was, all of these bleeding children and people dead in this uh, enormous pile of rubble in Oklahoma City, the response of not just other Oklahomans, but the rest of the country and the rest of the world was unbelievable. People all over the world wanting to, ready to drop everything at a moment's notice to rush to Oklahoma City to try and make it better for people that they didn't even know. Uh, for me, that is still 20 years later the real legacy of what happened in Oklahoma City and kind of uh, odd that it, uh, that, that it turned me from a pessimist into an optimist, uh, really did. And I'm, I've always been very, very grateful for that. But it was also an indicator of just the way that uh, your job sometimes um, is more than just a job. And in journalism, uh, you can become extremely um, powerfully moved by what you see. And at the same time, you have to continue to remember that your job is to focus on what you're seeing. And uh, not get carried up in it because you've still got to communicate uh, what's happening to your viewers or readers or listeners. So uh, that's just a, a sort of in a nutshell about my path uh, uh, in journalism. And I've always been really, really uh, felt very, very fortunate that um, that I was at the radio station that morning when all that happened and that, I, uh, that that sort of lit the fuse. On, uh, on what I do. I'm a little, uh, we'll talk about the future of journalism a little bit. Um, I'm a little concerned about where we're all headed because when I was, um, when I was your age, <clears throat> when, um, life kind of stopped every day at six o'clock, at least in my family. As a military family, we were always pretty interested in what was going on in the rest of the world. And, um, you know, people would say, Hey, at six, it'd be quiet. I have to watch the news now. People felt like watching the news was kind of a um, an obligation. We all had an obligation to be uh, informed, and it was easier to do that because in those days there were only about you know your TV didn't get that many channels to begin with, uh, unless you lived um, somewhere out in the sticks and you had cable. Back in those days, the only people who had cable were the people who didn't live close enough to a city and had an antenna to pick up. Uh, television stations. And so <clears throat> maybe your TV only got, say, five channels, and three of them were doing news at six o'clock. And so you didn't have the opportunity to, oh, watch SpongeBob or a game show or a, a, a rerun of um, 90210 or whatever it was. There was no, you know, there just weren't, weren't a ton of choices. And so by having fewer choices, we were all dialed in on, on watching the news. There was no DVR, so you weren't watching last night's episode of Empire. I mean, you know, it just didn't, none of that stuff sort of came into play yet. Um, 
and we did, uh, and, and there, were, there was also no internet, so you didn't have any competition for if, if you wanted to know what was going on, what had happened that day uh, in Washington D.C., for example, what had happened in Congress, you pretty much had to be sitting there at six o'clock to find out, or you had to wait until the next day until the newspaper came. So we have this very collective experience of people um, sharing in uh, in journalism back in those days. Well, that started to change a bit with it. Cable television came along, as satellite television came along, and there was more and more competition. And then the Internet blew the whole thing up. And all of a sudden there were... I mean, when, when when I say that there used to be five channels, well, how many channels do you have in your you know at your disposal today? And I'm not just counting television. Uh, I and mean, your TV probably gets I don't know what thousand channels it feels like nowadays. But the internet is millions and millions of channels. So uh, and 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 then you don't necessarily have to be watching at six o'clock. Um, you can watch the six o'clock news at eleven o'clock at night, and that's even and that's only if you're still interested in what was happening at six o'clock, rather than wanting to know now what was happening a couple hours later. So the, the task of journalism has gotten really, really tricky. Um, the other thing that is that has changed uh, for for journalism is not just your viewing habits, but the immediacy of it. In the old days, uh, I, I would go cover a story. And I would have uh, quite a few hours uh, to give, make sure that my story was all properly put together, talk to lots of different people, and then come back and put my story on the air. Well, nowadays, uh, nobody's going to give me hours and hours and hours anymore to get my story together. They, they want it right away. Uh, I need to be tweeting about it uh, while I'm covering it. I need to be putting up a Facebook message about it. I need maybe an Instagram picture to go with it. Uh, and then as soon as it's – in fact, maybe it's all being carried live while I'm watching it. So I don't have time to digest and say, well, here's what just happened. Maybe you're seeing at the same time that I am. Um, and so that makes the, the job of a journalist uh, almost a technological trick rather than really being able to dig down and find the facts and make sure that my story's balanced. Uh, it, it, it's gotten very, very complicated. Uh, I don't know how many – uh, let me see a show of hands. How many people um, read a newspaper at their house? What? Wow. That's great because that's really unusual that there's that many young people who are actually picking up a newspaper. Now, maybe you're uh, you're watching, you're reading it online, but in the old, that's what I mean. We've all uh, a lot of people my age really still love the feel of a newspaper in our hands, um, and that's just sort of an old, cute idea to a lot of people now. Uh, and the um, the newspapers are having a really hard time surviving because the way that that business used to work. All of this, this newspaper, all of these ads in it, and those ads paid for uh, the journalism that was inside. Well, there's hardly anybody now picking up that newspaper and seeing those ads. Now they've got to be um, buried somewhere online. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I never even notice an ad online. I don't click on any of them. I uh, so so we're all trying to figure out in journalism. Even though we understand that everything, not just newspapers, but what I do, what magazines do, what radio does, we're all headed in this funnel. We're all headed online. Well, that's great, except how do we, how do we continue to make the money that we used to? And I told you earlier that I don't love to think of journalism in terms of being a business, but the fact is it somehow has to pay for itself. Well, I'm really concerned about that because most people who uh, – most people your age certainly – don't expect to pay for the things that they read or see online. Uh, there's a couple of, of, of subscription things that we're willing to pay for. Maybe you, maybe you're willing to pay for your pan, for for ad-free Pandora uh, or something like that. But um, for the most part, nobody is willing to pay. Everybody kind of feels like uh, what they see and watch and read on the internet ought to be ought to be ought to be free for the taking. Well, that's a really tough business model. When you're talking about, you know, when Kwame Kilpatrick fell apart as the Detroit mayor and all these text messages came that ruined his career um, and uh, also told us a lot about what had been going on in the city, it was a really immense piece of journalism by the Detroit Free Press that put it all together. Their legal fight alone cost the newspaper about, between 7 and $8 million. Now, who's going to pay 
that in this modern world where people aren't picking up a newspaper anymore. Um, Because a lot of people feel like, well, citizen journalism, which is sort of um, just people starting a website and saying what's going on, that that's going to fill the the, the gap and the void. I don't don't think so. Uh, 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 Citizen journalism is not going to come up with seven to eight million dollars to lawyer up to fight for these text messages. So I think we're at a really interesting moment for journalism. There is more journalism being practiced in the world right now than ever before. And there is more journalism being read and devoured about what's going on in the world than ever before. But there is uh, a, a, a huge question and quandary as to how it's going to be paid for and uh, how long this current model can continue to go. Uh, we're very lucky in Detroit. People still like to watch the news. Uh, we're one of the high, in fact, our 11 o'clock news on Channel 4 is usually the highest rated uh, 11 o'clock newscast in the country of the big of the big stations. And that says a lot. I mean, I'd love to say that it says a lot about Channel 4, and I think it does to a degree, but it really says a lot about people in Detroit who are more interested in watching the news than, say, people in San Diego or... Um, uh, Miami or Atlanta or Kansas City. I mean, it's, it's really hard to explain, um, but there's just more people uh, sitting around their television still watching news in Detroit, and I'm really lucky about that. So let's um, – oh, oh, I'll mention a couple of my, my – quickly my other, my other careers here. When I, got, when I left um, the University of Kansas, I was kind of depressed because I had a lot of different things that I liked to do. I was obviously interested in theater, but I was also, uh, I loved music and was interested, you know, loved the idea of being a musician. I loved to write. Uh, I loved doing all these other things. And I, I, I thought, okay, the day that I'm graduating, this is the day now that I have to decide the one thing that I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And that was kind of a bummer in a way because I felt like I had to leave all those other things behind. Well, I did for a while because I had to go prove myself as a journalist. But one of the great lessons of my life and the one that I hope that you'll take with you is that nobody does just one thing with their lives. Um, Think about your teachers there at school. I I know you think, well, this is my teacher. My teacher teaches me all day then goes home at night and thinks about what they taught me all day and then prepares for what they're going to teach me tomorrow and they start all over again. Well, your teachers' lives might be a little more complicated than that. Yes, your teachers are your teachers, but they're also musicians. They're also chefs. They're gardeners. They're readers. They're writers. Uh, They raise tropical fish. I mean, it's just a million things that it takes to make a full life. And life is like a big cafeteria. And so if you've got all these things that you like to do, these passions, those, I think, are where your life is really lived. And I've I've developed a passion. I I was very lucky and happy to develop a passion in journalism. But I kind of also have these other passions. And so, you know, I've got a band. And my band and I, you know, in fact, we're just starting to put together our summer uh, summer schedule of, uh, of, of concerts. And then I also write children's books and have um uh, crazily enough now uh, just this past uh, winter my uh, 16th book was published and that was something that i never saw coming i loved it to, i love to write and it means a lot to me um but it's just been uh, i i certainly didn't see it becoming sort of like a, another it's, it's really not another career i couldn't make a living at it i don't think um but it's just been a, a really great thing to realize that nobody does just one thing. It takes a lot of different things to, to, to sort of uh, put a life together. So um, I wanted to leave, uh, leave time for questions. And uh, I, I, let's see how much I may have even uh, we're already at nine o'clock. I don't know how, how much time we've got, but if you've got any questions, fire away. Yes, in the green. For my books, you know, they come from a lot of different places. But one one thing that is uh, has been funny about my books, uh, almost all of them have started not with an idea for a story, but I get the title in my head first. The very first book that I wrote was a book called Fibble Stacks. And I had no idea what that word meant or what it was going to mean. I just was trying to jumpstart my imagination. And I thought if I came up with the right word, it might put some ideas flowing. And I invented this word fibble stacks. And oddly enough, it started me thinking about, da-da, there it is. I see. Beautiful. Um, that started me thinking about where words come from. 
And so before I knew it, I had built this whole story about uh, the guy that invents all the words we use. It took me, I wrote that book, I uh, wrote the manuscript for Fibblestacks the year that our oldest child was born. Griffin was born um, in uh, 1988, and um, it took me uh, about 10 years to get it published. After I wrote it, I, I, had, I read it to people, I read it in schools, and people really liked it. I thought, oh, I'm going to go get this published, like it was just going to happen with a snap on my fingers. Not quite. Uh, the publishing world is a little more complicated than that, and it took me 10 years to find somebody who liked Fibblestacks as much as I did. And I really hadn't thought much beyond um, my one book. Uh, I just wanted to get a book published. And then after Fibblestacks came out, my uh, editor called me and said, um, I want you to think about it. She didn't say write it. She just said, I want you to think about a book called A is for America. Well, I couldn't think of anything else. I started thinking about all the things that my country means to me. And so, and here, there it is. Here comes A's for America. Uh, that book, unlike Fibblestacks, which took really, in a way, 10 years to write, uh, A's for America, I wrote in about three days. Uh, I was obsessed, and I could not stop thinking or writing that book. And, and they were already interested in the manuscript. And I remember calling my editor and uh, three days after she had said, think about it. And I said, well, I think I'm done. And she laughed really hard. And she said, well, why don't you send us your, send me your outline. And then we'll, we'll you, send me your, what you've written so far. And we'll use it as an outline and go from there. So I faxed her the story. I told her this, how long ago this was. I had faxed my story. To her. And um, she called me back in about two hours and said, you're done. I'm not going to change anything. So writing a book can either take 10 years or three days. I prefer the three-day method if you can do it. Um, but then slowly, I uh, same thing. These, these the books kept coming, and, and it generally was a title that would get my ideas flowing, and that was certainly the truth. Truth. This one, I'll do my sharing now. The, whole, the book. This one is uh, Memoirs of a Goldfish, which was uh, a book that was inspired by my daughter Christian. She came home one day and she said, oh, "There it is, too." Uh, Christian came home one day and said, Dad, I think there ought to be a book called Memoirs of a Goldfish. And I freaked because I thought that was the greatest book title that I'd ever heard. And we started talking as a family about because most families have had a pet fish, whether you went and bought it or you wanted it at some state fair or whatever. And uh, and it, it can either turn into a serious, crazy hobby with a huge tank or, you know, you end up with a burial at sea and flushing it down the toilet after it dies in the bowl. Um but we, uh, you know, we started, con and that was the other thing that's really helped my book career is my family. Uh, I've got, we've got four kids, and my wife, Corey, has been, in fact, she's, uh, Corey and I have written two of the books together uh, about our home state of Kansas. And um, so I've, I've, I, the ideas come from all over the place, but the title and my family have been the, uh, the places where they've been most likely to come. Other questions? Yes, in the front. I, I, you know, I mentioned uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a couple, but Sydney, Australia, um, is the coolest city in the world I, to me. I just I, I couldn't believe that I was there, and it's it, the, the craziest thing about it is that the station wasn't going to cover the Sydney Olympics. They were just going to they were sending they, they they had put together a trip to take some clients so that they could go, and it was the day before the Olympics were starting that I got a phone call at home and one of those clients had canceled. And the general manager called and said, do you want to go to Australia for the Olympics? This is the day before. <laughs> I said, is this a trick question? Uh, of course I want. And, and we managed to find a way for me to get the credentials. And because I didn't, I, I had no interest in, I mean, I, I would have been fun to just go on vacation and sit there and watch the Olympics with the other clients. But I thought if I'm going to get there, I'm going to cover these things. And so, was a kind of a crazy exercise because I didn't have a photographer, so we had to kind of use network footage along with me being there. But we've managed to get the credentials, and uh, I, I just there, from from not even thinking about going to be sitting in Sydney, Australia, you know, twenty four hours later uh, was just the most amazing thing. And Sydney is just hyper hyper cool. Now, my favorite city in the world is Rome. And I've been lucky enough to, I've covered the Pope and, uh, and, and the Vatican quite a bit. And so my job has taken me to Rome probably four or five times uh, over the years. And, and uh, I just, I feel very at home there and love it. But the coolest place is uh, Sydney, man. It's, 
A OK. Uh huh. Uh, it's mostly country and folk um, and um, uh, some songs that sort of have a Western uh, kind of kind of feel to them. Um, but, yeah, I was um, I was kind of a, you know, while all of my friends as I was growing up were listening to Kiss and Journey and Boston, um, I was kind of a, 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 a I'd, I'd be quietly sneaking in at home to watch Hee Haw. <laughs> um, uh, I loved Merle, you know, grew up, my dad is from Western Kentucky and I, I think that had a big influence on it. Um, but I, I, I just have always had a real thing for country music, love bluegrass music, but I, because I was in theater, I also love sort of the musical theater music and standards and jazz and all that stuff too. So I, I really like just a little bit of everything, but for my band, it's, it's, it's pretty much straight ahead country with steel guitar and the whole thing. No, good, cool. Um, I will one. Uh, I'll quickly point out. Um, I, I think a lot of people think that it looks like I've got uh, jobs that are kind of all over the place. I don't think they're nearly as disconnected as it may seem. When you think about it, a journalist, a uh, book writer, and a songwriter—they uh, all have one thing in common: and storytelling. I love stories, uh, and when you get down to it, the best journalism is a story about something that happened. Now journalism we rely on stories that are true most of the time and in uh in uh books and music you know you sort of sort of make up our own but when you get right down to it i i, I guess i'm a storyteller that's what i love to do uh-huh boy i get asked that a lot and i i, I don't have a great answer i i know that i couldn't live my life without music um, that would be the hardest one to give up. Um, there's, let me look around here. I'm trying to see how many musical instruments are even in the room that I'm in here. Cause I, 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 I've been trying to learn the mandolin a little bit, but I play a little ukulele. I play the piano. There's one of those over there. And, um, there's usually a guitar stationed around somewhere. So it's really hard for me to get through a day without playing something um i just really am drawn to music so that would be the one that would be really hard to, for me to to live without um i think when you when i get down to it you know it, it feels today this many years later like a journalist is what i am um and uh, as much as i uh, th those other things are, are my passions and i don't you know it's a funny thing some people think that you're lucky if your job is your passion and other people other times uh sometimes if your passion becomes your job it no longer is it, it can't remain your passion i had a, uh, one of my best friends from high school uh, was a sportscaster for a while and uh he ended up he was in, he he got out of he was working at a, at a tv station in uh in boise idaho and left there and was trying to decide what he was going to do next. And he went to, he was a huge, had grown up a huge sports fan. And he called me one night because he, he was at a Kansas City Royals baseball game. And he, he, was, he called and he said, I just want you to know I am having one of the best nights of my life not covering this game. He didn't have to worry about meeting his photographer in the locker room afterwards. He didn't have to worry about getting the story on the air for the late newscast. He didn't have to worry about whether the game was going to end in time for him to get it on the newscast. He just got to sit there and watch a baseball game and have a hot dog. And uh, I, 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 I completely understood what he meant because sometimes when you've got these journalistic um, worries that you have to have, you can kind of, some of the fun is, is taking a little bit out of it. And so I, I kid Bernie Smilovitz all the time that, you know, sometimes when the Red Wings are in, in the playoffs, um, Bernie needs the game hopefully to be over by 1120 so that he can show the highlights and talk about the score on the air. I just, I, I get to just stay a fan. I just get to keep watching, you know, the Wings in the playoffs. So uh, it, it gets to stay my passion and uh, in some cases, as we're about to have college basketball season, my obsession. Um, but for Bernie, he's got to, you know, he's got to. So I, it's a fine line between uh, that obsession and sort of um, uh, uh, occupation part. But I am lucky enough to be very passionate about, about what I do. And I think that when you get down to it, what I am is a, a journalist first. Yes. Yes.
Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, that part, I'm not, uh, some of that is changing technically, but let me start with the one thing that I think any journalist really has to have. It's, and, and this is the first question that I ask a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people who want, want to talk to me about getting into journalism. Um, a lot of people talk to me about wanting to be a reporter and what, and after a few minutes of talking to them, what I can tell is what they really mean is they want to be on TV. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is a that, that's a fine goal. And there's a lot of different with all these channels in the world. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of different ways to be on TV, um, and, and it's great. But if you want to be a journalist, there's a there's a little something that that probably needs to underpin that, and that is having an insatiable, natural, genuine curiosity about the world around you. Having, I mean, uh, just about anybody that I meet, I can come up with 50 questions to ask them <laughs> because I'm just fascinated by people and the way that they live their lives, where they live their lives, what they do all day. I'm just, you know, I'm fascinated by how things work. I'm fascinated by the way that relationships um, uh, end up impacting the way that things happen. Um, I, 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 I have a natural interest in, in, in history and politics and all. So, so I have this curiosity and I've known some people who are in television news and they really don't have that. And I think this is a really cruddy way to spend all your time, you know, asking all these questions and interviewing people. If you really don't, have this, you know, this juice for wanting to understand how and why things happen the way that they do. Uh, it's too hard for one thing. But as a journalist, it, you know, you get to see the couple of minutes a day that somebody's on the air talking about their story. But most of their day, and they, you know, they 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 spend their entire day trying to get to that two minutes that they're going to spend telling you about what happened in this trial that they're covering. But for their day, it's been. Only take out that two minutes. The rest of it has been waiting for phone calls to be returned, um, sitting through what can sometimes be very tedious legal procedures, uh, dra dragging your photographer all over town to get the interviews that you need to put the story together. So uh, journalism is too hard for somebody who just wants to be on TV. So separate that out first. If you want to be on TV, I'm all for it. And as I'll, it, 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 but it's got to be easier. There got to be easier ways to do it than trying to be a reporter or a journalist. So then, then the other part that we've got to start to develop is, is, is uh, as I said earlier, uh, if you're a journalist, you're really a writer. So it really helps to have uh, a great writing talent or at least an interest in becoming a great writer, I think. Now, some of that has been replaced by, as I mentioned earlier, live obsession with journalism. And that means that you got to be able to think clearly and on your feet, um, not the way that I did that first morning talking about the bombing in <laughs> Beirut, Lebanon on the radio. Um, I've developed at least to hope, hopefully a better, uh, a better skill set of being able to keep my head a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes things happen and it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it is a little uh, hard to, to stay composed. Um, but being able to think on your feet uh, in the live TV, live broadcast, live webcast sort of world is also a really important component of all this. Um, and then uh, the, the the last thing is 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 I think that you've got it. And now it, this this is more important than it used to be. But you've got to have uh, a certain finesse with with technical the way things work technically. Um, can you run a you know? Can you figure out how to get a webcam? Uh, running up live on a website and connecting, you know, connecting the sort of technical dots to get whatever it is you're covering. Because in the old days, uh, there was a reporter and he would travel around with a photographer and a, a, a sound man. And in fact, if you see network television news crews, they've still got those three man crews, reporter, photographer, sound man, and sometimes a producer as well. Sometimes you see a four person crew. Well, more likely than not, when you start at a, if you start at a TV station up in, say, Cadillac, uh, Michigan, it's going to be you and your camera <laughs> and your notebook. You are going to, you'll be a one man, a, a one person crew. And fortunately, technology has turned it so that really, I don't even, you know, do I need a camera or do I just need this? Do I just need my phone and maybe a, maybe a slightly better microphone than the phone that's on the, uh, that, that, that comes installed on a phone. Um, but 
if I've got an internet signal, I am a crew just about anywhere I go then now. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I think that you need to be thinking about if you're, um, if you're interested in, in pushing forward into this brave new world. Anybody else? Anything else? Anything I didn't cover? Yeah. We've got four children. Um, we just hit our empty nest this past uh, this past fall. Uh, our youngest two are twins, and one is at the University of Michigan studying theater. Um, one is at art school in Baltimore at a place called the Maryland Institute College of Art, and. Our oldest two, one is ha, ha, went to the University of Michigan to study theater and is now out in Los Angeles trying to make it as an actress. Uh, in fact, I talked earlier about b ways to be on TV. There's, uh, you guys may be familiar with After Buzz on uh, YouTube. Uh, well, my daughter is uh, one of the After Buzz hosts for uh, the House of Cards show on uh, on YouTube now. And then my son Griffin is uh, a writer and. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've got four. Nobody, I guess the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? <laughs> an artist. My wife, Corey, is an artist. So I've got an art student, two writers, and a, 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 I mean, two actresses and a, and a writer. Uh, Griffin is, uh, he lives downtown in, in downtown Detroit, uh, works for a, a, a video and com a video production firm. Uh, but he's actually uh, next week going on an interview to try and uh, become a teacher in Japan. So we'll see if we'll see if that works out. But he's got the same kind of wanderlust that his dad has. So. Coffee is required at eight thirty in the morning. That's for sure. Um, yeah, my schedule is a little strange compared to the schedule. Uh, when, when people hear my hours, they just think it's really odd. But I work the equivalent of the second shift at the auto plant. <laughs> I work uh, from uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon until midnight. Uh, I usually get to go home. I, I don't live very far from, uh, from Channel 4. I live in Gross Point Park, which is you know, about uh, 10 miles from, uh, from the station. And so I, I get to come home for dinner most nights unless there's something crazy happening. Um, but yeah, my, uh, now the other thing is that my hours, frankly, are, you know, dependent on what's happening in the world. If there's something crazy, like, you know, the other day we had this uh, big tanker explosion on I-94, man, I need to be, you know, you had to get to work earlier. Uh, so uh, there was one day, you know, we had this guy who thought he was going to bring down a plane over Detroit with a bomb in his underwear, and I found myself working on Christmas Day. So you just that, that with journalism, you just never, you know, I I I have set hours, but the uh, the world sets its own hours for me too. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a little bit of an odd schedule, and my wife is uh, used to you know because people look at Corey and they're like, isn't that strange that you're you know? But not, I mean, Corey and I have uh, our mornings and early afternoons together to go shop or do whatever we have to you know get done, and uh, then see each other for dinner. But uh, she's she generally goes to bed without uh, when I'm not home because <laughs> I, I get home about uh, twelve thirty at night. All good. Really happy to do it, and I uh, hope I've inspired some of you to think about journalism. Again, I think it's a terribly important uh, part of uh, living in a living in a functioning, well-running democracy. So, thanks very much for spending time with me, and uh, you guys have a great day.